This is Base Webb, who's facing charges of attempted murder in Paris, Kentucky. A week prior to this, a surveillance video outside a Kentucky jail captured the alarming moment when Webb, a former inmate with a three-month sentence for assault charges, accelerated his car in an attempt to run over two jail employees. One of the employees narrowly avoided the vehicle, but the other suffered injuries as Webb's car pinned him against a wall. However shocking his crimes were, wait till you see how Webb handled himself in court. During Webb's initial court appearance, presided over by Judge Vanessa Dixon, his disruptive behavior persisted. Before the proceedings continued, Judge Dixon informed Webb that she recused herself from the trial due to her acquaintance with the targeted jail employees and because she simply didn't want to see Webb at all. This is where things got a little crazy. Just in case you missed that, we'll slow it down for you. Webb literally spits on the judge. Not the brightest move to disrespect the person who was responsible for your freedom or continued incarceration. In fact, immediately after being spat on, Judge Dixon orders to charge him. However, things didn't end here for Bass, because only a short period after this incident, while awaiting trial, he, along with four other inmates, incited a riot at the Fayette County Detention Center. During this chaotic event, Webb was shot with beanbag bullets and struck in the neck by a pepper ball. Undeterred, he proceeded to hurl a metal telephone box at a corrections officer. Fast forward to Bass's next courtroom hearing. This time, in addition to his previous two counts of attempted murder related to his vehicular attack on the jail employees, Bass is also facing third-degree assault charges for his involvement in the riot. However, if you thought the story of Bass Webb ends here, you're deeply mistaken. Because now we fast forward five years later, and Bass is once again in court. This time, Bass is facing charges for the murder of an ex-girlfriend from almost a decade earlier, Bria Runiewicz. Interestingly enough, Bria had been studying to become a law enforcement officer and was a Bourbon County Jail employee at the time of her murder. A cold case was resurrected following a jailhouse tip that led to the discovery of the victim's remains. During this particular court appearance, Webb showcased a shocking new appearance adorned with sinister head tattoos. These tattoos unveiled a disturbing murder hit list targeting judges, prosecutors, law enforcement officers, and the media. As the courtroom proceedings began taking place, so did Webb's antics. Webb, do you want to come forward? Here we see the judge ask Webb to come forward and stand. Instead, Webb decides he would rather not and smiles at the request. Following over a week of courtroom proceedings, the jury reached a verdict, finding Webb guilty of intentional murder. The trial provided details of how Webb choked his former girlfriend to death and buried her in a shallow grave. Bass received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Bass Webb is a prime example of a convict acting crazy in court. However, 100 mile per hour car chases might even be considered to be a little more crazy like in the infamous case of Ryan Stone, who was facing multiple charges, including attempted manslaughter in Denver, Colorado. In March 2014, Ryan embarked on a crime spree that extended across five counties and was broadcasted live by a new station's helicopter. The chase itself was nothing short of chaotic. Stone can be seen forcefully stealing two vehicles, one of which had a four-year-old child inside it. According to authorities, Stone's escape led law enforcement on a high-speed pursuit, surpassing speeds of 100 miles per hour. If you watch closely, you'll see the vehicle Stone was driving collide with a Colorado State Patrol trooper. Trooper Bellaman He had been trying to deploy stop sticks when Stone's vehicle collided with him. This incident resulted in multiple broken bones. This is when things got crazy. Only minutes later, the broadcast would film Stone forcibly removing another individual from their vehicle before fleeing the scene. The chase would transition to a foot pursuit after Stone crashed the hijacked car in the middle of an intersection. Stone sought refuge in a parking lot where he encountered slippery ice, causing him to lose his jacket. His path was soon obstructed by an insurmountable fence. Eventually, 
law enforcement closed in on Stone, and he ultimately surrendered. The chase lasted a grueling one and a half hours during the morning rush hour. However shocking the case was, wait till you see how Ryan acted during his trial. Ryan was facing multiple offenses, including attempted manslaughter, first-degree assault, and child abuse, but that didn't seem to faze Ryan. Instead, prosecutors played jail phone recordings where Stone seemed to enjoy the chase and boasted about the global attention. Hey, did you know I made the news in the UK and Australia? What? Yeah! My lawyer told me I made the news in the UK and Australia. If you type in Grand Theft Auto on YouTube, my shit comes up first. Stone even mentioned that YouTube typically compensates individuals for videos like his and declared his intention to contact Channel 7 News to demand payment. You get paid by YouTube. So, uh, Channel 7 News, I believe, is going to be the one that gets paid for that? Well, um, I'm going to contact Channel 7 News or have you contact Channel 7 News <laughs> or somebody, a lawyer. Tell me, hey, look, yeah. I want to get paid. When appearing before Judge Paul King of the Douglas County District, Ryan broke down, blaming his crimes on drugs and asking him for a lesser sentence because he wants to start a family with his wife. Time to start a family of my own. With my beautiful wife. Ryan's attempt at appearing remorseful in court did not mix after the court saw the videos of him bragging about his virality to a friend. The judge handed down a staggering 160-year prison sentence no parole eligibility for 75 years. This guy is a menace, and he is gone from us now, and we are better for it. Ryan's behavior and reactions drew people to his case. However, he's not even our craziest convict, because next, we have a case that features two brutal teenage murderers in Antonio Barbo and Nathan Pop, who are facing charges for murder in Sheboygan County, Wisconsin. The two teenagers brutally killed Barbo's great-grandmother, 78-year-old Barbara Olson, in her Sheboygan Falls home in September 2012. According to police reports, Barbo struck her several times with a hatchet as his accomplice, Nathan Pop, simultaneously used a hammer to bludgeon 78-year-old Olson to death. Only minutes after the attack, the boys would be seen on surveillance footage getting gloves and wipes, almost acting as if nothing had happened. However brutal the slaying was, wait till you hear how they justified the murder. How much money was there in the cash? About, I think, 150. And where is that? Some of it went towards food. And then um, we got pizza. And then some of it went towards weed, which I think is actually still at his house upstairs if he didn't get it yet. That's right. You heard that correctly. The boys decided to murder Barbara Olson for money to buy pizza and weed. Watch here as surveillance footage captured the boys just hours later, enjoying a couple slices, almost acting as if they hadn't just committed a murder. During the trial, Barbo entered a plea of no contest to first-degree intentional homicide. This plea was part of a deal that reduced his charge. Previously, Barbo had pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, but he changed his plea in this proceeding as a result. Barbo was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 36 years, by which time he would be 50 years. When given the opportunity to address the court, Barbo struggled to express himself and could not complete his statement. I know I don't show my emotions much, and I'm, I myself am not sure why, but that doesn't mean I don't. His lawyer stepped in and finished on his behalf. I took away someone's mother, their grandma, sister, friend, when I had no right to do so. As he was escorted out of the court, Anthony can be seen crying and sobbing. His accomplice, Nathan, was also sentenced to life imprisonment and will not be eligible for parole until he turns 45. He showed no emotion as he was seen leaving the court. What makes Barbo and Pop's case so shocking is because they were barely teenagers at just 14 years old. However, other cases went viral because of rather unusual rulings, like the case of Susan Marie Mellon, a woman who spent a staggering 17 years in prison for a crime she didn't commit. She was allegedly involved in the beating to death of Richard Daly, a homeless man. At 42 years old, she was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. 
She is seen here in an interrogation begging a detective to believe she's innocent and didn't commit the crimes she's accused of. Anyway, I'm, uh, uh, are you sick or injured? Do you have any medical problems? Okay, well, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna uh, book you. Uh, 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 no, no, I'm not gonna believe. I'm talking homicide. I'm talking homicide. A man was murdered. All right. Susan was found guilty based on the testimony of an informant who was later discovered to be a habitual liar. During Susan's interrogation, she was persistent on the fact that she was innocent and could never be a murderer. However, Detective Wynn from the LAPD didn't believe her. In fact, she was so certain Susan murdered Rick, she arrested Susan for murder before her interrogation was even over. With no one else to listen to her, Susan turned to God and prayed she wasn't actually going to be arrested for a murder she did not commit. Fast forward 17 years, Susan is 59 years old and about to be exonerated in a Torrance courthouse. The petition is granted, the judgment is vacated, the conviction is overturned, and as to Miss Mellon, the case is dismissed. Watch as she is instantly met with tears of joy and an outpouring of emotions. As she hugged her grandchild for the first time, she said she had always believed the truth would come to light someday. I even wrote freedom on the bottom of my tennis shoes with a black marker because I believe I was going to be free. She never lost faith and maintained her conviction that she would walk free one day. Now that the day had arrived, she couldn't contain her happiness and even broke into a joyful dance. As Susan embraced her family, she forgave those who wrongly imprisoned her, emphasizing the importance of forgiving even one's enemies. She eagerly anticipated sharing a McDonald's Happy Meal with her youngest daughter, reminiscent of the day they couldn't have one due to her arrest. I'm in prison, but freedom wasn't in me. I always felt like I was free in the inside. Well, I mean, I still kind of in shock. I don't know if it still hasn't hit me. I didn't want to be bitter. I didn't want to be a miserable old lifer. I, want, I knew I was going to go home. Is that your first cell phone? Yeah, I never yeah. had one. I don't even know how to turn it on. <laughs> I'm free! <laughs> Exonerations are not frequent. However, Susan Mellon isn't the only person whose exoneration case went viral. There's the case of Daniel Villegas, who spent 18 years in prison for a double homicide he never committed. At the young age of 16, Daniel was convicted and has been behind bars since. On April 10th, 1993, Armando Mando Lazo, 17, and Bobby England, 18, along with two other individuals, were walking home from a house party when a car approached them slowly and sped away. Witnesses reported that the car turned around and came back toward the group, eventually stopping. Someone from the back seat opened fire, tragically killing Lazo and England. However, the story doesn't end there. You're probably wondering how Daniel became a suspect to the case in the first place. Well, as it turns out, there was actually no physical evidence linking Daniel to the crime in the first place. There was no DNA found, no firearms retrieved, and no forensic evidence linking him to the case at all. He was convicted based on the testimony of a friend who claimed he confessed the crime to him. But this was a reliable witness in 2014 who told the detectives, I asked him if he did it, and he said yes. 16-year-old Villegas was brought in for questioning, an El Paso detective threatened him with beatings and the death penalty unless he confessed to the murder. Under duress, the teenage Villegas signed a prepared confession from the detectives. He attempted to withdraw his confession a few hours later, but it was already too late. Villegas was charged with two counts of capital murder, with the false confession being the sole evidence against him. After spending 18 years behind bars, his verdict was eventually overturned, and Villegas was released on bond. He got married and started a family during this time. However, a third trial awaited him, which would determine his fate. Finally, the moment arrived, and Villegas stood in the courtroom, uncertain if he would return home to his family or be sent back to prison for life. Watch as the judge delivers the news to Daniel that his 18-year-long nightmare was finally over. In the District Court of El Paso County, Texas, 409th Judicial District, the state of Texas versus Daniel Villegas, number 940D09328. The El Paso jury found him not guilty of capital murder, marking his true freedom since his teenage years. 
Verdict form B. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... Daniel was incarcerated for a total of 23 years, 6 months, and 11 days. Daniel's case is guaranteed to bring out your emotional side. However, not all courtroom proceedings gain attention because of the feel-good factor. There is the disturbing case of Nico Jenkins, who is facing charges after he embarked on a killing spree spanning a 10-day period in Omaha, Nebraska. When Jenkins was just 15 years old, he was sent to a youth correctional facility and served a decade-long sentence for carjacking and assault. Shortly after his release from the youth correctional facility, Jenkins went on a rampage. On August 13, 2013, Jenkins lured two men, Julian Uribe Peña and Jorge C. Cariga Ruiz, with the guise of having intimate relations with two women, only to abruptly shoot them. Only four days later, on August 17th, the body of Curtis Bradford was found. Bradford was a former inmate Nico had encountered during his time in prison and proceeded to kill him in his own garage. His final victim was Andrea Kruger, a victim whose body was found by the road with multiple gunshot wounds, all of which took place in a two-week time period. Jenkins was initially arrested on unrelated charges. It was during this time that law enforcement stumbled upon evidence connecting him to one of the murders, including the matching ammunition. The authorities confronted Jenkins with their findings, emphasizing the substantial evidence they had amassed against him. You don't realize I got Nico Jenkins? You don't realize that? I got Nico Jenkins. I got you. What do you mean you got me? I got your DNA in the murder scene. I got your DNA in the car. Sure. I got the weapon. I got Nico Jenkins. The motive behind these gruesome acts was as shocking as the crimes themselves. Jenkins claimed that the murders were sacrificial acts for the Egyptian god Apophis. Like, okay, my religion of Katoni Ashwabel, that's the underworld, he was like on the mummy, the black book. So this was them, my little cousin. So when I went in the house with me, that when I got to serve the search warrant, right. this was their ritual of sacrifice. Jenkins entered a plea of no contest to the four charges of first degree murder and voluntarily waived his right to a trial by jury. The court proceedings were marked by Jenkins' erratic behavior including speaking in tongues and fits of laughter. Ultimately, a panel of three judges would conform to determine his guilt or innocence. One of these murders was a deliberate and planned act. The victims were pre-selected and the murders were purposeful. The murders were characterized as deliberate and premeditated, and the victims being specifically targeted. The defendant's commission of these four murders over a 10-day period is one of the worst killing sprees in the history of this state. Upon being convicted of all four murders, Jenkins remained motionless as the sentence was delivered. The panel unanimously concluded that the death penalty was fitting, imposing it for each of the murders committed by Jenkins. Strikingly, Jenkins exhibited an unresponsive demeanor in the face of being sentenced to death. Should be and is hereby given for each of the four murders by the defendant. Additionally, he received a staggering sentence of up to 500 years in prison for his other charges. However bad you think Nico Jenkins' case was, it can't be compared to the infamous and devastating case of Jeremy Christian, who was facing charges for multiple murders in Oregon. The incident occurred while Christian was aboard a crowded train, where he directed a racially motivated rant at two young women. A bystander on the train was also recording the incident. And if we rewind the footage, right there, you'll actually see Christian smack an innocent bystander's phone to the ground for no reason. It was here when chaos erupted on the train, 
Passengers, including Micah Fletcher and Talisa Namkai Mechi, confronted Christian and tried to intervene to protect the girls. Christian became increasingly aggressive and confrontational. The situation only escalated from here, and Christian pulled out a folding knife, attacking Fletcher, Namkai Mechi, and Ricky Best. The attack resulted in the deaths of Best and Namkai Mechi, while Fletcher survived and sustained serious injuries. Immediately after committing the crime, Christian fled the scene, with passengers from the train following him until law enforcement arrested him approximately one mile away. The footage of Christian in the back of the patrol car was also shocking. However shocking you thought the crimes Christian committed were, wait till you see how he acted in court. Christian faced trial and was convicted of two counts of murder and attempted murder. During the sentencing hearing, Christian displayed erratic and disruptive behavior. Demetria Hester, a black woman who Christian had previously attacked, expressed her frustration with the court's handling of the case. She felt the court failed to protect her and the other victims from Christian's disruptive behavior and disrespectful actions during the trial. It was at this point that Christian unleashed an outburst, uttering derogatory remarks about the victim's mother and expressing wishes of damnation upon them. Good measure, as Jeremy was being escorted out of the courtroom, he made sure to add these disturbing remarks. Judge Cheryl A. Albrecht then handed down a sentence of two consecutive life terms, along with an additional period exceeding 25 years to account for his other convictions. For many people, Christian got exactly what he deserved. However, this wasn't the only time convicts got a sentence that was so befitting, viewers can't get enough of it. There was the case of Seth Welsh and Tatiana Fusari, who were facing charges for murder in Kent County, Michigan. In August 2018, Mary, a 10-month-old infant, died due to neglect, malnutrition, and dehydration. The investigation revealed that the family home was unclean, with evidence of vermin, insects, and mold. The autopsy performed on Mary indicated that she suffered from chronic malnutrition attributed to the deliberate withholding of food and water. Tatiana and Seth would argue in court that they didn't know Mary was deprived and suffering. The prosecutors in the case were baffled at this argument. Don't tell me you didn't know that. And don't tell me you didn't intend that because you didn't get her little tush out of that crib. You left her in there, you ignored her because she was an inconvenience. Child Protective Services had been involved with the family since 2014, when traces of THC was found in the system of their eldest newborn child. Despite their prior interactions with Child Protective Services, Mary's parents refused to seek medical assistance, even though they knew she was severely underweight. They cited religious reasons and a lack of trust in the medical system as their rationale for not seeking help. I believe I'm being unfairly charged and uh, being made an example of for my uh, very strong faith. At the time of Mary's death, two of their three children had never even been taken to a licensed doctor. However shocking you think this case is, it gets even crazier. Because once Seth and Tatiana discovered their lifeless child, rather than calling the police or the ambulance for help, they called their lawyer. How long ago did you find this child? Uh, it's about an hour and a half. I um, was waiting. I called my lawyer for a day to ask, you know, what's the next thing I can do. So you found the child an hour and a half ago? Yeah. And called your lawyer first, correct? Yeah. After an emotional court hearing, 
Seth Welch was convicted of first-degree murder in June 2020. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. However, Tatiana Fusari testified that her husband had been physically violent and sexually abusive towards her. She claimed she was not allowed to take their daughter to a doctor and attributed her inability to care for Mary to the abuse. He smacked me across the face and he told me that he knows how I... He said, you know what the f I think about doctors. Do you want to keep bringing these people into our home? All you keep doing is bringing these government people into our home. You want to keep doing that? I told you Mary is fine. She's f***ing fine, now drop it. Kent County Judge Paul J. Denefeld didn't see it that way. He convicted Fusari of first-degree murder and sentenced her to life in prison without parole. This is the moment the couple realized they would be spending the rest of their lives behind bars. You that you murdered one Mary Welch. That is a charge of homicide felony murder. It is life without parole. It requires a DNA sample to be taken upon arrest. The second offense that you're both charged with is called child abuse in the first degree, where they're alleging you knowingly or intentionally caused serious physical harm to a child. They're talking about this Mary Welch. It is a felony, possible penalty of up to life imprisonment, or any term of years less than life. If you thought these courtroom moments were shocking, you wouldn't imagine the details that get revealed in this interrogation. Click here.